Good afternoon, everybody. I'm happy to be here and to talk about the United States and China. Um, so um, I'm an economist and I'm interested in international political e economy. Um, and what I'm going to present today is the result of a book that I've published recently, a couple of months ago. It came out in, um, in French. Hopefully soon there'll be a, an English um, translation. But anyway, you, you will have the pleasure to hear an English presentation about that book. So, right. So, let's start immediately. Uh, yeah, and don't hesitate to tell me when I need to stop talking because once you get me talking about this, I, I'm unstoppable. Um, well, so, um, so picture the, I mean, if you look at the global economic situation, the, there's a lot of trouble going on. I mean, you've all heard about the, the trade war, technolo technological battles, chips, and so on. There are financial sanctions. Um, there's, of course, renminbi internationalization. There's the Belt and Road Initiative. And there is also an arms race going on in the Indo-Pacific. And all of those things are related to one specific conflict. I mean, not exclusively related to that conflict, but nevertheless, there is like a common thread, which is that there are increasing tensions between the US and China. Um, so as probably many people here in this room, I very much like to, to read the Financial Times and they are very worried about the global situation, understandably. Um, and they have their very specific analyzers analysis of the situation. So here's one quote that you have on, on my slide, which is a quote coming from Martin Wolf, uh, who recently said, geopolitics is the biggest th uh, threat to globalization. Um, in, in a very similar way, uh, uh, Gideon Rachman um, tells us that geopolitics threatens to destroy the world Davos made. So there was, there was just before the Davos Summit 2023, and Rachman is also like one of the figures of political liberalism within the FT. So um, their analysis of the situation is quite clear. And I mean, I, I could multiply those kinds of quotes from similar circles. It's not just the journalists from the FT, but they seem to agree um, that the problem is geopolitics. So there was, you know, there was globalization and it, it, it seemed pretty fine. It worked neatly, tidily. And then all of a sudden, there were some politicians coming in and, 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 and there was a mess because the, the, the politicians were much more into geopolitics. And, and so basically you have this opposition between, well, the global economy was working fine and then there was, um, and then there was geopolitics coming in. And this is pretty much the, the major reasons that you find also in the academic discussions. Um, so typically, why is this pro why are the why are there those troubles today? Well, what Robert Boyer recently told us is well, it's because um, nationalist governments came to power, and he was specifically um, thinking of Donald Trump. Um, so Donald Trump is the, is 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 the guy that um, made globalization derail. Um, but I I think the kind of explanation, well. Um, fits not very well into our current situation because uh, if it's only about Trump, why hasn't the situation changed ever since Trump um, lost the, 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 the presidential election in the US? And even more fundamentally probably, um, if the troubles only start with Donald Trump, um, then this suggests that before Trump, there, was, there were no problems, no tensions at all Whereas actually, as you'll see throughout the presentation, um, there were tensions and contradictions going on already much, much before, before uh, the, the arrival of, um, of Donald Trump. So um, I'm not really, really convinced by this kind of account that um, focuses on, on nationalist governments. And I mean, you do not only have the version um, um, ascribing responsibility to Donald Trump, um, if you look at Joseph Nye, not, not an economist, but a very distinguished um, international relations scholar, he basically has the same explanation as Boyer, 
except that the problem does not come from the US this time, but the, the problem comes from China, because since, uh, since, since there is uh, Xi Jinping, China supposedly is enthralled by a vision of national greatness. So it's basically the same argument, just on the other side of the Pacific Ocean. So again, the same problem. Um, the tensions actually did not just start with Xi Jinping in 2012 or 2013. Tensions started earlier. If you continue rushing through available explanations of the trouble, the current troubles in globalization, you also find um, Adam's, Adam Tooze's explanation, which is kind of, you know, it's kind of different because he says, well, Washington isn't listening to business on China anymore. So uh, here you have this idea that, well, it's of course good for business if there is, you know, harmonious international relations. And since there's trouble in international relations today, well, Tooze considers that this precisely stems from the fact that Washington used to listen to transnational corporations, but they do not do this anymore. Um, but what is quite inconvenient with Tuz's explanation is that there is an array of studies, ev even up to today, um, showing that actually Washington is very much listening to, to business. Um, and therefore, um, this hardly fits um, with, with, re with reality as well. So basically, that, that, that is the starting point of my research. It is, well, why are there these troubles in globalization? So I tried to, to find a solution to this. Um, in, in order to do so, I, I took an international political economy approach. So I tried to put together several things. Um, Marxist and regulationist uh, macroeconomics, a neo Gramscian focus on social groups, um, and also um, priority granted to infrastructures, which is more the, the structural international political economy influence in, in, in that book. Uh, I, I've been rereading uh, Susan Strange, I, I, I guess many of you know uh, about Susan Strange and her concept of structural power. Um, so these are the, the three core elements of, of, of the book. And the main argument that I put forward is that capitalism undermines globalization. So this, sometimes this creates some misunderstandings because usually people think that, well, globalization is just one kind of capitalism, but that these two words are more or less uh, synonyms. Um, so uh, le let me specify right from the start that when I speak about globalization, I do not only speak about the multiplication of trade flows, financial flows, and so on. Um, they are, of course, part of globalization. But what I add from an international politi political economy perspective is that there is a multiplication of transactions, um, and those transactions happen under the supervision of the US state. So what happens is with the rise of China, China, by becoming um, a capitalist country through its capitalist trans transformation, uh, has been forced to undermine the very process that allowed its rise to power. So it is undermining really existing, really existing globalization. It is trying at least to undermine uh, the US supervision of global capitalism. And I, I refer to this as the sorcerer's apprentice effect. So maybe you know that the, the, this Disney cartoon or even the original poem where you know that you have the sorcerer's apprentice trying to make the, the broom do his work and then it gets all out of hand and the, 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 the castle where they are living in is flooded. And that, that, that's how I picture the US first um, trying to, to, to convince China to join globalization and then China somehow grows out of, out of control, out of US control and, and, and therefore um, is not willing anymore to perfectly fit into a global economic order under US supervision. Um, it rather tries to build its own um, China-centered global market because China, of course, is not 
against global markets as such. It's, it's just trying to get out of US controlled global markets. Um, therefore, the outcome is that we have this US-China rivalry. Um, and in order, to understand the, in order to understand the depth of that rivalry, I think it's crucial to go beyond just market shares, to go beyond transactions, and to actually have a look on infrastructures. Because infrastructures, um, I mean, are the foundation through, through which um, transactions can actually happen. So if you control infrastructures, um, then you have a control on transactions, and you can also um, exert extraordinary political power. Um, and when I'm talking about infrastructures, I'm not only talking about the usual physical infrastructures, not just roads or electric grids or something similar. No, I'm also talking about technical infrastructures, so technical standards. I'm talking about monetary infrastructures, dig digital infrastructures, and military infrastructures. And basically, on all of those different levels, China is trying to build um, new infrastructures, which are basically Chinese controlled. So the battle is not just on transactions, on market shares, it's more a battle about markets as such. Uh, and you can see that battle, you can see that battle through, through infrastructure. So I'll be talking a lot about infrastructures today. So yeah, here you have the, the, the cover of the book. And I'll try to give you a guided tour, a quick guided tour through, through the book. So first of all, a focus on, on how, how the US um, actually managed to supervise globalization. Then a focus on China and how China integrated into globalization. And then the, the last three points um, show various ways in which China challenges globalization, challenges US supervision, and actually builds its own infrastructures. So let's start immediately. Um, probably that the first part is, is something that m most of you are already more or less familiar with. Um, so my account starts with the structural crisis of US capitalism in the 1970s. Um, structural crisis that you can see, I don't know, behind there, if you can see the graph, you can see perfectly. Uh, so, um, well, one way of accounting for, for the crisis is to have a look on, on the decreasing profit rate in the US that started in the, in the 1960s and lasted until the uh, early 1980s. And there are several explanations of that um, dynamics. Um, I, I did not really try to figure out who is wrong or who is right. I have a more eclectic, eclectic approach um, integrating um, various dimensions um, put forward by different, different explanations. So there's, of course, um, the, the, the fact that, you know, um, workers struggling, um, fighting for higher wages, which at least throughout the 60s and very early 70s had an impact on squeezing profits. Uh, then you have Robert Brenner's focus on international competition. So you have new uh, newcomers arriving on the US market, especially from, from West Germany and, and Japan. Um, so you have, here you can see the, the lasting legacy of fascism, because if you destroy the workers' movement, well, then this, um, of course, contributes to your um, competitiveness on the international scale, so there's international competition. And there's also what Dumenil and Levy um, point out, which is the decreasing efficiency of of capital linked to the exhaustion, exhaustion of the, the prevailing uh, techno-economic paradigm. And this uh, plays a major role, at least in the, in, the, in the second part of the 1970s. So you have that crisis. Um, and the crisis is immediately, quite quickly at least, perceived by the US political establishment as a crisis that is not just an economic crisis, but a, a very much uh, political crisis. And um, 
I have this quote from Nelson Rockefeller, who used to be vice president, um, and of course, somebody coming from a very wealthy background. Um, so he was vice president from 1974 to, to 77, I think. And he said the entire structure of our society is being challenged. And I mean, you, you do not only have this decreasing profit rate, but you have you know, a whole economic slump. Um, and this is what Rockefeller is referring to. So it's not just an economic crisis, but it's also a political crisis which triggered a desire in the ruling class, in the US ruling class, for radical change, for a radical reorganization um, of, of the US economy. So Fordism did not work anymore. Something new needed to be found. Um, and if you think of this in terms of class analysis, well, then keep in mind that there was this Fordist arrangement which was more or less an alliance between US labor and the national fraction of US capital. So I distinguish different class fractions within capital especially. Um, so this arrangement was in crisis and the, well, if, if just some short definition. So the, the national fraction of US capital is basically the part of US firms that make their profits on the domestic scale. So mainly, uh, reliant on domestic consumption. And then there is another fraction uh, which, uh, which is called the transnational fraction of US capital. Um, and this transnational fraction is actually regist registering most of its profits not on the US territory but uh, abroad. Um, and so the crisis of Fordism, the 1970s structural crisis, is basically, as I said, a political crisis which put into question the uh, arrangement between US labor and US national capital. So the national fraction of US capital has been, you know, they, they, they lost their credibility. Uh, and, and therefore, um, US government, various US governments were looking for something new. They needed a new idea that was sufficiently radical to reorganize society. Uh, and, did it, and, and that at the same time sounds um, sufficiently realistic. Um, and now you could wonder why US governments would, would turn towards capital to have an idea to, of how to get out of the crisis. Um, and, 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 and often the link between companies and governments is a link of lobbying. So they have many lobbying explanations. And there very certainly is lobbying, but I think there is even a, a deeper level of links between capital and the state. Um, and if you're interested in that kind of issues, well, you might have a look on, for example, Klaus Office 1970s work uh, about the capitalist state. Um, I mean, there are, there are also other, uh, other researchers such as um, uh, James O'Connor or Fred Block. Um, and what you find in those different accounts is the idea of a structural interdependence between the state and capital. Um, and when, when it comes to the state, what is crucial is that the state, in order to reproduce itself, in order to materially exist, the state needs um, a very dynamic uh, economy. Because basically the resources for the, for the state's resources come either from taxes or from debt. And for both of them, you need a minimum level of economic activity. So the state for its own existence um, has an interest in, 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 in ongoing accumulation. And therefore, since the crisis was precisely a problem of accumulation, the state was looking for new solutions. So it's not just a lobbying account where transnational capital pushed the state into reorganizing the US and even global economy. No, the, the interest of reorganization also came from within the state. So basically, we have this contingency where both uh, the transnational fraction of US capital and the US state were looking for a reorganization and, 
And this reorganization is, is what, ev what eventually became um, to be known as globalization. Um, so you have that link which explains why throughout the, subs the subsequent years the US state was very actively promoting um, globalization. Um, and I mean, this, this very much looks like um, what David Harvey calls a spatial fix. So you fix the over, the domestic uh, over accumulation pro problems by um, finding uh, new, um, new investment opportunities abroad. Um, but of course the state does not necessarily fully know how actually to, to build globalization. Um, and what is quite striking is if you look at social network analyzes of different US administrations since the 1970s, here you have only since the 1990s uh, a quantitative evidence, but it, it basically is already the situation since the 1970s. What you see is that um, when it comes to foreign economic policy, um, the, the major positions were held by people coming out of the transnational fraction of US capital. So those people in charge of actually formulating concrete ideas of how to build a global market uh, mainly came from so-called policy planning organs. I mean, you have many of them. The, the, the most famous are probably the, the tri Trilateral Commission or the Council on Foreign Relations. You have like f 15 organizations or so that had been on the forefront of finding ways to uh, make globalization work. And those people were working from within the US state, um, from within the US state, and were promoting those policies. Those policies that, I mean, you, I think you're familiar with the Washington Consensus and liberalization policies, even in, in, in the UK, in Europe, in Japan, so I won't go into the, those details. And I immediately um, go move forward to the results. Because, I mean, the, um, the situation in the US after the, the 1970s crisis was basically, on the one hand, financialization domestically, but also internationally. But even more internationally, there was globalization. So, um, uh, uh, Cédric Durand calls this the, the, the knot between financialization and globalization. Since um, the reorganization of the US economy implied, of course, um, to um, limit domestic consumption, so wages were not rising anymore, um, well, there was a need of um, finding political stability despite uh, increasing inequality and I mean, the financialization solution is just that you can keep consuming, but more and more based on, on debt. And then you have the globalization um, impact as well, which is that since globalization basically allowed US consumers to get access to cheaper consumption goods, while well, people could feel that their consumption was increasing, even though their wages were not increasing. So you get political stability, Th thanks to the knot between financialization and globalization. So you could have domestic stability and at the same time, well, US transnational capital became increasingly dependent on access to the world market. What this graph shows is basically the relation between uh, the profits of US transnational corporations abroad and um, domestic profits in the US. Um, uh, and you have uh, financial profits and you have productive profits, but basically the, the, the situation is the same. You see that with the beginning of, of globalization in the, in the 1970s, well, the ratio increases, meaning that an increasing share of uh, the profits of, of, of US capital comes from abroad. Therefore, um, of course, the US state, depending on the stability coming from those foreign profits, has also um, a, a distinct interest in maintaining global markets open to, to its corporations. 
So this is the situation. Now maybe you wonder, well, why hasn't he spoken about China? I thought that this, this talk was about the US and China. Well, this is basically the context in which um, China got integrated into globalization. And of course, a significant share of all those profits here, especially the blue line, the blue curve, is coming from China. So therefore, let's, let's, let's move to China. Um, what is interesting is that one of the reasons, one of the major reasons um, Chinese authorities decided to draw in globalization is that there was a domestic economic crisis also in China in the 1970s. So there were supply problems, there were uh, huge price increases, inflation. So it seems like, well, what, 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 what the, the Chinese Communist Party was, was, was doing did not really work out that well. Uh, and there was also this contrast where, well, China was into, in, in, in this slump, whereas the so-called Asian tigers, Taiwan, South Korea, they all seemed very dynamic and they had those export-oriented models. So what, what, what came about is a shift in, 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 in economic policy, which eventually turned out to be a full-fledged full uh, capitalist restoration in China that started in the late 70s. So China basically decided that in order to accelerate domestic development, it would be helpful to liberalize, to re-establish capitalism. And this was, of course, wonderful news for, um, for US transnational capital because they very well saw that there's lots of cheap labor in China. And in addition, uh, it was quite well educated and quite, uh, quite healthy. So China was a wonderful destination for US transnational capital. So there was this quite interesting, cir there were these quite interesting circumstances where you had kind of a converging interest between US capitalists and Chinese, com uh, Chinese communists. They all were, uh, they all agreed on the idea that um, China should join globalization. But what is crucial is that they did that for fundamentally different reasons. And this is something that, that, we, are, um, that we have to deal with today. So um, from the US perspective, well, integrating China into globalization should allow to increase profits. Whereas Chinese authorities thought that by joining globalization, they could accelerate national economic development. So fundamentally different reasons, but that converged at some point in the, in the 1980s, 1990s. So they were at temporarily, they were um, common, common interests. So you had this huge um, and radical transformation of the Chinese economy throughout the 1980s um, and 1990s. Uh, I won't go into the, the details, but I'm, I'm very happy to speak about that later. Um, yeah, and of course, the, the, the most symbolic step within that process was when the, uh, the Chinese Communist Party adopted the idea that China was now a socialist market economy that was in 1992. Um, yeah, so great news for U.S. transnational capital because now the Chinese market was open. And the Chinese market was open to them. Um, at first, just in special economic zones, but uh, little by little, the whole market got opened um, to them, uh, which, of course, was rather bad news for Chinese workers because they, um, well, lost, for example, the, the, the guarantee that they would have lifelong employment, um, different aspects of social pr protection were dismantled, um, labor law violations became quite frequent, unemployment rose, and so on and so forth. Um, very interesting. By the way, I mean, you have this story about um, China developing its middle class. 
Um, there's a very interesting paper by Stephen Knaus who, who tells us that actually it's not so much a middle class, it's rather that you have a, a, a full proletari proletarianization of China, um, which you can also find in other indicators. The, another story about China is this idea that, that there is a, a very, very uh, successful reduction of extreme poverty, which is that line. So if you take the $1.90 threshold, the World Bank's um, extreme poverty threshold, then there was indeed a, a quite radical decrease of poverty in China. But if you take the OEC, uh, OECD subsistence basket, well, then you'd first have a very high increase of poverty due to liberalization, which you can easily understand. I mean, people maybe had higher wages in China, but at the same time, as there was privatization of, of education, for example, well, they had to pay for education. So uh, an increasing share of, of their money actually went into things that used to be available for free. So the subsistence basket uh, poverty indicator shows that actually there was first a quite strong increase in poverty, which then slowly decreased. So after 30 years of liberalization in China, basically the um, what has been destroyed has just been, had just been repaired. So it doesn't sound as successful if you just take another indicator. Yeah, and quite interestingly, if, 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 if you want to have a, a wonderful summary of 30 years of labor relations in China, then the, 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 the Friedman and Lee paper is wonderful. And, and I very much like the quote that, uh, that, that, that they have at some point. So they say the acceleration of privatization, re restructuring and redundancies in the state-owned sector triggered levels of insurgency unknown in the history of the People's Repo Republic. So meaning there was a lot of, there were lots of various struggles, so, so some of them quite, quite violent. So uh, Chinese workers did not actually just um, happily accept what was going on, but there were quite intense struggles um, in, in, in China. Nevertheless, for U.S. transnational capital, this was, of course, a, 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 a wonderful thing. So maybe the, maybe the revolution is not a, a dinner party, but in, uh, what, what is for sure is that um, Chinese liberalization is a dinner party for U.S. transnational um, capital. I mean, it's not so easy to get a clear idea of the extent to which U.S. transnational capital actually benefited from the subordinated integration of China into globalization because the data on, on, on foreign direct investment, for example, well, it is, is blurred by round tripping, but you have evaluations telling us that uh, approximately 20% of, of foreign direct investment in China is coming from the US. Um, and then, of course, you have global value chains which are not directly related to investment, where a lead firm just has control over a value chain without actually having to invest, which is, of course, uh, particularly good news for companies trying to increase the profit rate because um, while well, they do not have so much additional investment spending and still profits are going up, so that's wonderful news for, 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 for the profit rate. Um, and if you want to have a... a, 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 a an adequate picture of, of the extent to which U.S. companies rely on value chains based in China. Well, what William Milberg suggests is just to look at the imports, the U.S. imports from low-income uh, countries. And so the table here shows you the data for various years. Um, what you see at first is the total imports, the total imports from low-income countries to the U.S. is increasing. And within Within that figure, China's share is increasing. So China's share within the U.S. imports from low-income countries moved from 10% in 1991 to 33% in 2007. So you see that not only was the subordinated integration of China into global capitalism um, good news for U.S. transnational capital, but actually U.S. transnational capital increasingly uh, relied on, on China. Um, so you have this type of very intense relations between the US and China, uh, which for 
15, 20 years could suggest that there was an actual transpacific symbiosis, um, which uh, Robert Boyer outlined in a very nice way when he said, well, you basically have inequalities in the US and China and they mutually uh, compensate each other. So you have complementary accumulation regimes across the Pacific Ocean. So at some point, this whole story seemed to be, you know, quite harmonious, quite symbiotic. Um, but what is crucial is that you actually have cracks appearing in this trans-Pacific um, construction. Um, so you have on the one hand a very extroverted uh, accumulation regime in China, which however already in the early 2000s highlighted that there was this faction with the way the international monetary system is organized. At the same time in the US, well, re related to increasing trade deficits, um, there is deindustrialization and related job losses, which led to the increase of the so-called deaths of despair. Um, there were also increasing, there was also an increasing number of US companies focusing on the fact that China was supposedly stealing US intellectual property, that China was implementing high-tech mercantilism. Um, and then you had also, of course, a little trans-Pacific contribution to, to the subprime crisis, where the arrival of, of, of massive uh, Chinese capital, for example, pushed to the bottom uh, interest rates in the US uh, and, and also encouraged European banks, for example, to, to, to look for other financial instruments than just the treasury bonds that did not provide uh, lots of returns. So you had cracks coming out of the transpacific relation um, that started already in the 2000s, so way before Donald Trump or Xi Jinping or, or whoever. Um, and these cracks intensified with the financial crisis in 2008, 2009. Um, because like every capitalist country, of course, China implemented a stimulus plan, but it, that was a very massive stimulus plan that actually increased problems of, of overaccumulation, which led the Chinese authorities to implement their kind of spatial fix. Um, and if you look just on the consumption and investment rates in China, you see that there's a, a huge change. Household consumption used to be quite, quite high in the 1980s. Um, and the aggregate result of, 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 of capitalist transformation was a very strong fall in the consumption rate. And at the same time, a very strong increase in the investment rate. So, I mean, now, nowadays there's lots of talk about um, Chinese overcapacities, but I mean, China has been in overcapacities for at least 20 years. Um, the thing is, they, they, there is something distinctly inconvenient for China when it is implementing the spatial fix, which is that unlike the US in the 1970s, the global market was already under control, under US control in 2008. But if you implement a spatial fix, then this is of course a source of risk, a source of uncertainty, because you decide that an increasing share of your um, domestic profits come from abroad, comes from outside your sovereign territory. So you become vulnerable to political de decisions that happen outside your territory. The US could manage this risk because they managed to um, not only make globalization, but make a kind of global market under US supervision. Now, China is trying to do the same thing, but the US is already controlling the global market. Therefore, this leads, this leads to tensions. So once you got this story, this causal story of how um, or why China is increasingly extroverted, then you um, are able to understand that 
from the point of view of Chinese authorities, well, the, the, the well-being of the Chinese economy increasingly has to rely on profits from abroad. Profits from abroad, except that the US is doing exactly the same thing. And that basically the whole global economy relies on different kinds of infrastructures related to US control. Um, here uh, you see a map showing some features of the, the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, Belt and Road Initiative, which has been introduced in 2013, and which can of course be seen as one of the expressions of the Chinese spatial fix, because when you built, when you massively built uh, physical infrastructures abroad, well, this represents a way of alleviating overcapacities. And since um, these constructions are not only made with Chinese goods, but also require quite high numbers of Chinese labor, um, well, there is also an alleviation of unemployment in China. Um, Another um, implication, of course, of the Belt and Road Initiative is that it allows to secure access to critical materials. Um, and then, then there is also a more um, military aspect to the Belt and Road Initiative, which is that basically throughout this whole zone, Indian Ocean, Pacific Ocean, you, ha you have the, the US Navy. And there are specific choke points that are particularly vulnerable. You have, for example, the Malacca Strait. The Chinese call this the Malacca Dilemma. Um, so this very narrow point is where China gets about 80% of its oil imports. And also, of course, a significant share of Chinese exports goes through that place. And there are other straits like this all over the oceans. Um, and so what China is doing with the, the Belt and Road Initiative is also that it is building ways of bypassing uh, the US um, Navy. So you have, for example, the connection between southern China, the Yunnan province, um, and, um, and how do you call it in English? Myanmar, exactly. Thank you. I mean, it makes a huge difference because from the Sitwe port to the Chinese border, it's about 800 kilometers. If you go all around the, in the Chinese peninsula to Shenzhen, which is a very small and minor port in China, well, this takes several thousand, 8,000, no, 6,000, 8,000, I, I don't remember. Uh, you can look it up in my book, I, I don't remember. Several thousand kilometers and therefore approximately two additional weeks. So it makes a huge difference in, ter in terms of time and in terms of risk. You have a similar story going through uh, Pakistan um, where China is building also a, a road connection, railroads, uh, pipelines, pipelines that allow to, to get um, oil di directly at the Gwada airport instead of um, waiting for shipments going through through the whole Indian Ocean and there is even a direct I mean they are planning a direct um, um, pipeline connection to Iran so there are ways of diminishing the the Chinese dependency on the US Navy um, another way uh, China nowadays tries to escape the US control of global value chains um, can be found when you look at uh, 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 at what uh, uh, Ricap and Lundval call the digital innovation race. Um, so I suppose that you know that the China is going through a quite extraordinary technological um, catch up. And this catch up is actually kind of a historical contingency again. Because if you, if you look at the history of technologies, you have, you know, you have um, different techno-economic paradigms. Uh, you had the, 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 the car and, 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 and oil paradigm through 
through the 20th century. Now we have the, the paradigm of the uh, um, uh, information and communications technologies. And, and the rise of China uh, goes hand in hand with a shift in paradigm, which is crucial because if you are in a specific paradigm, well, you have the pioneers and then you have the rest of the world. And most of the time, the rest of the world is not, uh, not capable of catching up with the pioneers. If, as in China's situation, the rise of China coincides with a shift in the techno-economic paradigm, then this gives uh, immense opportunities to, 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 to China because basically, um, well, there's a need for new machines, there's a need for totally new skills. So all of these things are just being made uh, and China can actually, well, catch this train quite immediately. So it does not suffer from the cum cumulative character of, 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 of innovations. First of all, of course, China was, 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 was just trying to attract foreign capital to the Chinese territory and hoped that foreign companies would um, share their, their te technology with the Chinese uh, partners in joint ventures. This actually never really happened. Um, and of course, that's not surprising because if you look at where value added comes from in global value chains, then you see that um, a, a, a main source of profits, a main source of value added within global value chains comes from uh, research and development. So it uh, would, would be kind of surprising if US transnational capital shared its major source of profits. So there was no real um, technology sharing which made the Chinese authorities to implement a major shift, which is their plan. It is a, a, a 15 years plan uh, aiming at promoting so-called indigenous innovation. And this is basically the moment where you can see in various data sets that China is catching up um, uh, from a technolog technological perspective. And just one indicator is if you look at the global shares in information and communication uh, technologies, if you look more specifically on IP5 patent families, then you see that, you know, 2005, 2006, um, China was not, not a major player in that field. But what followed, the following 15 years, was a rise, and now uh, China has even more patents than the US in that crucial um, area. And so, of course, this becomes a, a huge problem for US transnational capital. If you go back again to to the, 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 the smile curve the, the, in, in global value chains. Uh, I don't know if that, that rings a bell with you. I, I guess it does. Well, you see that um, value added comes, comes uh, mainly from, from R&D. And if China is now becoming a leader in crucial areas of innovation, well, then this uh, is an immediate threat to the profitability of, of, of US transnational capital. Um, I was planning to provide a more in-depth focus on the semiconductor industry, but maybe we don't have time for that because I have several other slides as well. So um, I keep that for later. I keep that for later. Just um, suffice to say that um, one of the ways um, the US now is trying to ensure technological leadership is, of course, by increasingly uh, um, implementing sanctions against, uh, against uh, innovative Chinese firms. Um, and it does so knowing that if you cut the semiconductor industry into different segments, well, you can find three major segments, assembly, manufacturing, and design. Uh, assembly used to be... Um, the, the segment where China is most prominent, which is also the least complex segment, whereas the US was most prominently involved in design. Um, and design is very complex, and therefore it's not so easy to replicate design. So when the US decides to cut the Chinese market from the most advanced semiconductors, 
this is of course a major problem for China because they know how to assemble things, but they do not so much know how to actually design uh, advanced chips. And that was the gamble that was be behind the minds of US policymakers. And this started in, 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 in 2016. Um, in, in the Obama administration, so they said, well, okay, we, we, we maybe can keep China from getting access to, to most advanced design and therefore we can ensure that they stay at their late comma position. Interestingly though, even though I do not have time to develop that, well, the sanctions somehow um, provided a, 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 an additional boost to to domestic innovation in China, uh, which is doing surprisingly good. Uh, I had some slides also on, on, on the monetary infrastructure, but I won't talk about this. So if you want to know why Valéry Giscard d'Estaing is standing in the Soviet Union with a rifle, um, you can ask me later. We won't go through that, nor this, nor that. Now, because, I mean, since this book is a political economy book, um, I wanted to uh, have a couple of words uh, um, about the question of hegemony before, before I stop talking. Um, so hegemony from a, from a Gramscian perspective is the combination of consent and coercion. So a hegemon needs to prov provide both of them. And, and if your ambition is to supervise the global economy, well then you need to deploy hegemony. And you cannot just come with guns and force everybody to do what you want. No, you need to make others think that what you are providing is good for them as well. So the US, when building globalization, has been deploying a hegemonic strategy um, which succeeded quite well in convincing the rest of the world that what the US is doing is good for, every, for everybody. Um, it's good for everybody, um, but I think, and there's quite a lot of data suggesting this, that the US is now actually struggling to generate consent um, among, among, among the world's population. So to some extent, it seems like the US is in a, in a, in a trap of hegemony. Um, it is not doing enough to create consent again, and it is increasingly focusing just on coercion. And if you have this disbalance in the hegemonic cocktail, well, this generally doesn't help you to actually continue supervise uh, the global economy. What the US basically is doing today is what Freddie Jameson, that just, who just left us a couple of days ago, what um, uh, Frederick Jameson called a communicational ideology. So the US are trying to make other countries adopt, adopt exactly their values, whereas China doing something very different. It is trying, the Chinese hegemonic project is trying to link different places in the world, but, but without expecting everybody to adopt their, um, their values. Um, and by doing this, China feels a, a quite interesting void. And I, I very much like this little anecdote uh, um, provided by Larry Summers when he was discussing with a, an official from, from uh, a, a country of the global periphery. And the, the, the guy from the, the global periphery told him, what we get from China is an airport. What we get from America is a lecture. And here you clearly have this thing. China is managing to respond to actual needs. And as a matter of fact, those needs had been increased even through the Washington Consensus. Because if, 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 if underdeveloped countries have to implement austerity policies, well, this has among other things, a negative impact on physical infrastructures. Now China is coming and is suggesting to build an airport or whatever. Well, this is a need that is indeed there uh, and it is quite often welcomed by the populations and leadership, even though there are problems of, of, uh, of, of financial dependency, of course. But still, I think this um, is quite insightful. And I mean, 
the various services that, that, that basically provide the, the same idea, which is that China is increasingly managing to generate consent for its somewhat counter-hegemonic project. This, <coughs> this, of course, is reinforced by, by, by the fact that um, the US are really poorly managing international conflict. Um, and, you know, th I mean, this is a tendency. This is not completely new. And there is a quite interesting study that came out last year showing that at, if at the US General Assembly you have two opposing propositions, one coming from the US and the other one being backed by China uh, uh, and or Russia, well, the latter um, has always, almost always, the, the majority support, whereas the US hardly ever gets majority support for, for its propositions. Um, so there is this idea that the US is actually being acting in a very hypocritical way on, 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 when it comes to international diplomacy. And this has, of course, been reinforced all the more uh, by the war in Ukraine where, um, I mean, the war in Ukraine and then the war in Gaza, because what, what the main argument, the main US and European, by the way, argument for Ukraine was we need to stop this war, we need to stop the, the Russian invasion because there are civilian casualties. And then comes the, 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 the war in Gaza and, 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 and nobody uh, ever talks about uh, civilian casualties anymore. Um, so again, I, I found an interesting quote from a, a senior G7 diplomat that said, referring to the, the simultaneous conflicts in, in Ukraine and Gaza. All the work we have done with the global south over Ukraine has been lost. Forget about rules, forget about the world order. They won't never listen to us again. So they lost a, a lot of credibility. The US lost a lot of credibili credibility, which does not necessarily mean that, that, that um, China is brilliantly succeeding. Nevertheless, you have increasingly uh, also uh, diplomatic initiatives coming from, from, from China. So the, the thing is that you have, that the, for, for me, the, the US look like, like this. Like they, they, they lost, they lost con contact with the ground. They, they are like somewhere in the air, um, but, but, but it failed to actually realize it at, uh, uh, at time. So they are increasingly accused of being hypo hypocrites. They do not make sufficient efforts to win over the rest of the world again. Whereas, well, China is doing that in an increasing way. But, and even worse, what the US is mainly doing, and this will be one of my last words, is um, that the immensely increased military spending, and, and, and especially military spending related to, um, to, um, to, to, uh, to its navy in, in the South China Sea and the Pacific Ocean more generally. So we have this situation where nowadays we have more military spending than during the hottest years of Cold War. This is, of course, I mean, the red curve is US uh, military spending, which is, of course, uh, by, by far the major uh, uh, major actor in this field, but you have also very strongly increasing um, Chinese military expenditure. But still coming back to infrastructures, well, there is still a quite radical difference in, in terms of military infrastructures between the US and China. Both are immensely increasing military expenditures, but if you look just at the US military bases just in the uh, Indo-Pacific region, well, you have about uh, 350, whereas China, you also have China, Chinese military bases here, well, you have about 25 here and one there. So it's, I mean, it's not the same level at all, but what you see is that China is militarizing its, its, its close neighborhood, which again is a place where you have the US Navy all over which of course increases the, um, the probability that there might happen frictions, even non-intentionally, which, which might lead to, to major conflict. So the US uh, at the moment seems to me that they are in this hegemony trap where they do not uh, invest enough in consent and, 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 and invest much more in, 
in, in, in military capacities. So just to sum it up, this whole story started with overaccumulation in the US, which then has been solved with a spatial fix. China becoming capitalist, facing similar problems of overaccumulation and tries to solve them with again a spatial fix, except that this time, um, well, the global economy is not freely available anymore because there is US supervision of globalization. So you have this struggle, which very much reminds me of this uh, Rosa Luxemburg quote, saying that imperialism is the political expression of, of the accumulation of capital. So you have um, various capitalist countries being um, caught in a competitive um, struggle that you know, mobilizes their integral state capacities. Um, I started with the Sorcerer's Apprentice. I, I, I end with it because you remember maybe that the, so, the, the story of the sorcer, sor, Sorcerer's Apprentice ends with the fact that the great sorcerer comes again and, and handles this story. Um, but I think that you know, in order to, 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 to get control back from, from this global situation, well, probably it's not the market that will provide a solution. Thank you.